And a big welcome to you, whether you're watching on television, listening on the radio, to our audience here, of course, and to our panel tonight, the Conservative Education Secretary, Nikki Morgan, Labour's Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, Diane Abbott, the Green Party MP, Caroline Lucas, the writer and former director of the Centre for Policy Studies, Jill Kirby, and a former Islamist who now campaigns against extremism, Majid Nawaz. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, as always, if you want to get involved in this debate, which you may well want to, you can text or tweet. Our hashtag is BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to 83981. Press the red button uh, to see what others are saying. Gregory Hayes has our first question. Was extending bombings to Syria the right or wrong decision? Do you know, I'm going to ask you what you think and one or two members of the audience what they think before we come to the panel. What's your view? I think it was the right decision. Um, I think it's just a shame that it took this long to get to that decision. Anybody else think it was the right decision? Yes, you in the front here. Oh, many hands up. Yes, sir. Yes, I just would say why. I would agree it was the right decision because uh, if, we're bomb if we're currently bombing ISIS in Iraq, it makes little sense to uh, stop at the uh, so-called border, which doesn't really exist anymore. Okay, anybody else want to come in on this? Any the, the woman in yellow there, over there. Yes. How will we ever know if it was the right decision when there was n clearly no referendum? Okay. And anyone else? Uh, you, sir, in the front, in blue. In the end, you have to confront an evil like that. You can't leave it to grow like a cancer. Okay, that's some view. What about the other view, that it was the wrong decision that was taken? If we go to the woman there on the gangway. I just think that the money should have been better spent on educating our youngsters to not be radicalised by these people and I just find that these young people, they're being groomed. If it's a young girl and a man, that's grooming, but these kids that are being taken over by religious fundamentalism don't get treated the same okay. way. It is a problem. And the man here in the pink shirt, you sir? Yeah, I think more of an immediate threat is like people who are crossing the border when you've got um, an e-border database system which is falling down twice a week. Surely it makes more sense to fix that, replace that system, and then we can tackle the issues in Syria. And you were against it, the man at the very back there? Yeah, I think we need to be honest with ourselves here. This is part of a racist backlash after the attacks in Paris. Cameron's own Foreign Affairs Select Committee and figures such as the head of MI6 have said that this will have absolutely no effect. When Cameron stood at the dispatch box, he said that we had low, uh, low collateral missiles. In reality, that means we hope not to kill that many civilians. Why are people in Syria um, coll uh, collateral damage and people in Paris victims? Okay. It's racist. <laughs> OK, well, you'll have a chance to, uh, of course, argue with our panel as we go through the debate. Nicky Morgan, you kick off from what you heard the man at the back there saying. Oh, well, thank you. Um, Firstly, uh, I think it was absolutely the right decision that was taken yesterday. Uh, it was a difficult decision for um, all members of Parliament and those who watched the debate will have seen uh, people on all sides really searching their consciences as to how they were going to vote. And I think anyone who thinks it was an easy decision for any member of Parliament um, would be mistaken in that. Uh, the second thing is I think we should just pay tribute, whatever we think about the decision, we should pay tribute to those who are now flying on the airstrikes and the pilots who are... Uh, who are doing that and their families who no doubt are worrying uh, about them. But just to answer some of the questions that have been uh, asked, the lady here about educating against radicalisation, um, she's absolutely right. Uh, obviously that's particularly relevant uh, to me as, as Education Secretary with young people in our schools. We need to do both. We need to uh, confront the clear danger that there is to our country from Daesh. And it's not just to answer the gentleman at the back, it's not just Paris. There have been attacks in Ankara, in Beirut, in, uh, earlier on this year in places like Yemen. Um, there have also been the, uh, the Russian plane blown out of the sky over Egypt. This uh, murderous death cult, it's a terrorist organisation, uh, is a danger to people not just in the West, but people around the world, and it's now time for us to play our part in confronting it. Okay. <laughs> Diana. Well, there are different views about this in my party. 
but I would remind the audience that the vast majority of Labour Party members, the majority of Labour MPs, and in fact the majority of the Shadow Cabinet, believe it was the wrong decision. And the reason I say that is because I do understand, in the light of Paris, a lot of people naturally felt that something must be done. The question is, will these bombing raids on Syria make the British people safer? First of all, as Nikki said, we should pay tribute to our armed forces who are putting their, putting their, their lives in harm's way. We should also think of the people of Syria who are waiting in trepidation for this bombing in cities like Raqqa. But we need to remember that if bombing was the answer, the US have been bombing Syria for over a year. And ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, is stronger than ever. They have captured cities like Palmyra, blown up all their monuments. They're stronger than ever despite their bombing. And that is because you cannot defeat ISIS dropping bombs from hundreds and thousands of feet. One of the things you need is ground troops. And whereas in Iraq, this is difference between Iraq and Syria, in Iraq you had the Iraqi army, which is hundreds of thousands of trained people. In Syria you've got Assad, and Nikki and the Tories are not saying what we're going to do about Assad in Syria. And so you've got Assad and you've got, yes, 70,000 people, but they're raggle-taggle jihadist. I believe that there are, it's not a question. Uh, people are saying we've got to do something. We're question of doing nothing. We need to talk to our so-called allies, like Saudi and the Gulf states, that are sending money and arms and trading in oil to support ISIS. We need to talk to Turkey, which is ostensibly a Western ally, but is allowing ISIS troops to go through its territory. We have the finest diplomatic service in the world. Why aren't we doing more with the big regional powers? And why aren't we doing more for what will actually be the biggest refugee crisis right. in the Second World War, the Syrian refugees? Right. No one is saying do nothing. Thing. Well, but these airstrikes are the wrong thing. And I tell you, I'll be here a year later and this audience will know. We've already been warned it's a long war. It's a long war and it's going to be a further downward spiral in the cycle of, course, of violence in the yes. Middle East. You, you, you just briefly, you mentioned Iraq. Of course, you and Jeremy Corbyn voted against the bombing in Iraq. Is that still your position, that that, that, that is also wrong? You, you mean the original Iraq No, 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 the, 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 uh, um, against IS in Iraq. Oh, IS in Iraq. I mean, IS Last in, September. I, IS in Iraq is, is a different situation, because the Iraqi government invited us in, and, and so it's legal. You voted against the bombing, didn't you, then? I think the answers to the turmoil we see in the Middle East is partly some of the work that Quilliam is doing, but partly we have to get the regional powers to start up, step up to the plate. The, the idea is, that yes, bombing will you solve voted it. And Jeremy Corbyn yesterday would not commit either to supporting airstrikes or not, nor would he commit mm -hmm. to continuing the air protection over the Kurds. Of course. You can say that no, in action. No, there is Nikki. No let, let me, there is such thing in action. Nikki, it is not confronting let the present me to the tell UK you. and sorting out the Let me tell you, the Syria. question about the Kurds is quite... The question about the Kurds is quite different because you have brave Kurdish troops down there who are retaking ground from ISIS. Of why course, wouldn't of Jeremy course Corbyn, in intervention, support the airstrikes? He was asked directly Jeremy by a member of parliament Jeremy, in the House yesterday. Jeremy was being barracked by Paul your Jeremy, right, you're Corbyn. Not, you're Jeremy not, Corbyn is leading the opposition. He, he was, was being, minister. He he was being barracked debate. by your people right. who were deliberately trying right, to disrupt. Diane, he should I'm, be right. doing debate. Don't, don't barrack her, Nikki. Let me, let me ask her, because I'm chairing this. <laughs> Do you now think that it's right to be using British air power in Iraq against IS? It's legal. I asked you whether you think it's right. Well, I, th I think it. its legality is quite important. I think it's legal. Well, it was and legal if, back in September when you voted against and it. And if it's part of a broader strategy, and we need to hear more from Nikki's government right. about the broader strategy, yes, of happened. course it's right. We had a lot. Of course it's right. If they're in, as part of a broader strategy. The notion right. that bombing yeah. can solve anything okay. Didn't work in the original Iraq war, didn't work in Afghanistan, and will not work in Syria. Right. Majid Nawaz. Yeah. So I, I understand the trepidation and the hesitation both on the panel and that nationally. I, of course, you know, I get it. I opposed the original Iraq war from my jail cell in Egypt, and I understand all of the concerns about invasions, 
and, and, and the collateral damage, which actually is death, because death is death, no matter what you call it. It hurts the people as equally. So I, I get that. I think there are a few principles we have to uh, establish here and set out before this conversation. And one of them is uh, this shouldn't be a left-right debate. Uh, Hollande in France, who asked for our support, is a socialist. The Kurds who are fighting uh, ISIS inside Iraq and Syria are left-wing socialists and some of them communists. So I think it's important to recognize that this, uh, there are different opinions on all sides of the spectrum here. Um, and, and that's important because I think so, so that we don't end up polarizing the conversation. I think it's also important to remember that some people say that our action in Iraq or, or Syria, our military action, will aid ISIS narrative that this is somehow a war against Islam and Muslims. It can do. But let's remember one thing. Our inaction has also aided ISIS narrative. When I first joined the Islamist group that I did at 16 years old, it was our inaction in Bosnia and the genocide there, there that led me to become an Islamist and join that organization because I was so furious at a genocide playing out against Muslims in Europe. So action and inaction can lead to promoting an Islamist narrative. So that shouldn't really be a basis for consideration in this question. I think also we were bombing Iraq anyway, as has been established. It didn't make much sense uh, not to then exp ex expand that to Raqqa because ISIS, if you remember when Caliph, so-called Caliph Baghdadi, descended from his pulpit and gave that one speech, that one public appearance, it was in Mosul. And he hasn't popped his head up since. And the reason he hasn't is because he's on the run since those bombings started. So where have they all run to? They've run to Raqqa. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense that we're bombing on one part side of this border that they don't recognize and that really isn't being policed. Uh, and we're not bombing on the other side. And I'm not saying I'm for bombing, I'm just saying laying out some of these principles. And finally, I think this is legal. The UN resolution that was passed committed us to pursuing, quote, all means against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Now, all means uh, don't exclude bombing. So where, where would I stand on this? I think that I agree with something Diane said earlier. It makes no sense to think we can shoot our way out of this problem. It makes no sense to think we can uh, arrest our way or legislate our way out of this problem. And we certainly cannot torture our way out of this problem because what we're dealing with and, and in recognizing this problem is not a war, it's not World War III. I think this is a global jihadist insurgency. And the only way to tackle insurgencies is to get at their support. And that means making sure we undermine the ideology that they're using to recruit people, the Islamist or theocratic ideology as distinct from the religion of Islam, it's not the same thing, making sure we're undermining that notion of theocracy and making sure that we're sapping the appeal because 6,000 or so European born and raised citizens have gone to join. How would you have voted in the House of Commons last night? Right, so that doesn't exclude bombing. I think if we can... Sorry, how would you have voted last night? I would have voted night? for the action. And the reason you I say would. that is a comprehensive strategy, as the UN right. motion said, all means it doesn't exclude the notion of bombing, but bombing isn't the solution on its own. All right, let's hear from some more members of our audience. <laughs> I have to say that I completely agree with Diane. I think that I, I don't understand how the government can say that by bombing Syria it will make Britain safer. We're going to um, isolate more mo moderate Muslims, potentially leading to greater radicalization. We're going to aggravate more people. There are extremists living in all cities across Europe, and by bombing Syria, we are not going to eradicate this ideology into non-existence. All right, and the woman there on the banner. I, I just wanted to pick up on something Nikki said about it being a really difficult decision, which I don't doubt, but should the cheering and laughter in the Commons following last night's decision not make the public question the humanity with which the MPs claim to be acting? And whatever you think is morally right or wrong, surely it's a sombre decision, you know, it's a decision to bomb people. All right. Jill Kirby. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. It is a decision that should be taken very soberly. And I thought all the kind of clapping and cheering after Hillary Benn had spoken was completely inappropriate in these circumstances. Um, it was a divided house. There were divided parties. Uh, and it's, it's a, it was a difficult decision to make. I personally think it was the wrong decision to make. I wouldn't support it. Mainly, I think, because I cannot see the way ahead. And I think too often we have become involved in uh, foreign entanglements like this, not knowing what our exit strategy is, indeed not knowing what our next step is. And I'm, I've heard quite a lot of what I would term wishful thinking um, from the government 
um, from, from the Defence Secretary and others, uh, from the Foreign Secretary, suggesting that uh, it's all going to be very nice and we're going to make life so difficult for ISIS in Syria um, that they will, they will uh, stop attacking us here and elsewhere, um, that the trouble, that the fact that we, we don't support the Assad government um, out there is not going to be a problem because we're going to manage to support the rebels at the same time as attacking ISIS, whilst President Putin is arranging to bomb a lot of the rebels also attacking ISIS. Uh, there are so many different factions involved here. Uh, we don't, I can't see us negotiating our way through this and having a nice, clean, tidy settlement. I think David Cameron realises it's not going to be clean and tidy, but I want him to tell us why in that case we have committed to this. Uh, when we're supposedly going to sit down with, with Putin and, and come to a nice agreement, he will keep Assad there for a while and then just move him aside. All right. uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a plausible scenario. Therefore, we shouldn't be getting into it. Nicky Morgan, do you want to answer that? Do you want to answer her point directly? Well, I think some of the points made by the audience, but also by Jill, are the points that were debated in ten and a half hours in the House of Commons yesterday. And I think the point is there is no certainty uh, about this or, or any of it. And I, that's why it was such a difficult decision for members of parliament uh, to make. But there is a comprehensive strategy. There is both the military strategy, there is also the political strategy. Does the military very, strategy very involve putting troops on the ground in Syria? Um, not UK troops. That The motion made that very, so which, very clear. which troops? Well, the Joint Intelligence Committee have given us the promise of the advice about the 70... Thousand troops the, the 20, Nikki, thousand. no one believes in this. Oh, hang on a second, hang on a second. But I've just, it's, so it's, it's about military, it's also about political uh, strategy, um, and Assad, we Yeah, but you can't just skip over Assad. it and say it's, no. that's, that's the ground troops dealt with now, let's and talk about the political the difference between it Syria has to be, and Iraq. Has to be ever, it, it, well, you're right, there is, a, there is a big difference. There is between, a big difference, because between. there are ground troops in Iraq, and there are not the ground troops in Syria. And time <laughs> and again, in the House of Commons yesterday, the Prime Minister was challenged about where were these mythical 70,000 forces, you know, and they've become the kind of the, the bogus battalions, as the chair of the Defence Select Committee called them, you know, the equivalent of the, the, the dodgy dossier. Because, in a sense, they are just in David Cameron's head. Even if they existed, the idea that they're going to be willing to give up fighting Assad, which is what their primary focus is, to helping us with fighting ISIL or Daesh, I think is, again, completely unsubstantiated. So I think that the vote yesterday was the wrong vote. <coughs> I haven't seen anything that's persuaded me that if the UK joins the, um, the, the airstrikes over Syria that we'll either be safer or we'll make the region safer. But crucially, Majid said something I think very important. He said, we need to undermine that ideology. Yes, we do. But do you know what? I think that by entering into bombing of, of, of ISIL, we are absolutely feeding that ideology. They feed on the idea that we are the kind of crusader West having this attack and they are the kind of defenders of true Islam. That is what they... Um, get their popularity from, and we are falling <coughs> precisely into that trap by doing exactly that. I want As to a result, 15,000, yeah. just one little, one little fact, that just, just that a year ago, there are 15,000 recruits from, uh, from 80 countries had gone to fight with ISIS. A year later, there's now 30,000 recruits from 100 countries. So our bombing is actually feeding that ideology. We are walking into their trap. It's the wrong thing to do. All right. Um, I'd, like to go, I'd like to go back to the audience again, and I want to, uh, I said at the beginning, we've got different opinions here. You've heard opinions against the bombing from Jill and from Caroline. I'd like to hear from people who would have supported the bombing or still do support the bombing. You say in the middle there, just from those people for a moment. Yes, just let's hear what your view. This Great Britain historically was built on British spirit to deal with evil around the world. This is the latest challenge to us. We've got to stand up and we've got to be counted on this. And it's only the fact that we're now in a reasonably, we were in a reasonably peaceful stage that people in Parliament have got this kind of pac pacifying view to do nothing. It's only a luxury. You're going to lose it. We've got to stand up and be counted. OK. And I take another... Are you also, were you also in favour of the action that Parliament voted on? You were. Can you say why? Uh, as negotiation, frankly, doesn't seem feasible with these uh, terrorists, uh, I'd be interested to know what the panel thinks uh, we could do in replacement for the bombings, uh, the airstrikes. Um, education alone of UK uh, young people does not actually eliminate the imminent threats of um, terrorist attacks worldwide. Yeah. Could it just okay. Well, yes, Caroline, your, your um, foreign affairs spokesperson said that 
what ISIS feared was, most of all, was peace talks. What does that mean? I don't know when they said that, but what I want to say is about the fact that when you're saying there's some the kind of um, pacifist uh, mentality here, maybe some people are driven by that, but I think we should look at the fact that people like John Barron, one of Nick's backbenchers, spoke so passionately. He is on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, a Tory. He's also a former military person himself. He served in Northern Ireland. He has come to the conclusion that this is not the best way of fighting this evil. Nobody um, disagrees with the idea that Daesh is absolutely barbaric barrack and they are murderers. The issue is what is the best way to make sure we get rid of them when you've got the Foreign Affairs Select Committee with a passionate report saying that they do not think the case has been made for military action. You've got the chair of the Defence Select Committee, another Conservative, again saying the case hasn't been made. And when we talk about, well, what do we do? We need to address the Syrian civil war first because that is what is creating the chaos which allows ISIS to thrive. So we need to be redoubling our efforts for right. the Vienna yes. Peace it's, Talks. It's we need to, let me just finish and then you can come in. We need to redouble our efforts with those Vienna peace talks. And again, listen to these experts who gave evidence to the Foreign Affairs Committee saying that precisely our involvement in bombing Syria is undermining the role Britain could be playing All at right. those peace talks because we were not, at that point, perceived to be allied with one, with one side. Sorry. So I, I spend a great deal of my time consumed by this question uh, generally uh, extremism and specifically with ISIS in Syria. And it's just factually incorrect. It is just wrong to say that the correlation of the rise of foreign fighters joining ISIS is caused by our bombing. And the reason it's factually wrong is if we go back to when and how ISIS was created and how it emerged, it, it filled the vacuum that the anti-Assad forces who were fighting against Assad, and I'm anti-Assad, it filled the vacuum that, that, that was there precisely because we didn't intervene. Yeah. And they used the narrative, and I know this because I've been following it every single day for the last eight years. They used the narrative yeah. that the West doesn't care about you Syrian Muslims, they have abandoned you, we're the only ones fighting for you, mm -hmm. and to come and join. No, no, that's just true. That's well, just, you can't just assert that it's true. No, you're there are shaking plenty, your head. Hold on. Let me Muslims finish. And plenty of, let me finish, of, please. Of let me finish. Let me finish, please. We've I've been watching this for the last eight years. We've been watching this for the last eight years. Had we gone in, the fact is, had we gone in and removed Assad, what would have happened then? The fact is that I'm not saying they don't use our bombing and our actions to recruit people. I'm saying they use our actions and our inactions. That's what happens when you don't control the narrative. They have propaganda, they control the narrative. We haven't recognized this as an insurgency. We're saying things like World War III. If we recognize that there's a propaganda out there, we would seize that initiative. When we don't, they seize the initiative, whether we how act would you or seize, don't act. How would you seize the initiative Well, in this instance, propaganda? I think bombing is part of the armory, not the solution. And what I would do is, look, for, for once, let's all of us recognize that there are heroes on the ground, champions who have defeated ISIS time and again, wherever they've confronted them. They defeated them in northern Iraq, they defeated them in uh, Kobani, and they defeated them in Sinjar recently, where ISIS enslaved the Yazidi women. Who are these champions? The Kurdish warriors. Now, there are political reasons why we can't say that, and that's because our allies in Turkey and our allies in the Iraqi government don't want the Kurds to have a state. If the Kurds got a state, it would be a torchlight, a beacon, the, the Middle East's only Muslim-majority secular democratic state in the entire All region. Right. And it would set a great example for everyone else. And they're right. defeating ISIS as we speak. OK. You. you. Yeah. I believe that, um, that so often we talk about what's going on in Syria, but the bigger issue a couple of months ago was about the refugees. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to ask is, um, we don't hear much about them now. And I know that people's instinct is to want to help the um, refugees. But in May, people voted that they didn't want um, immigration in the country. Uh, we saw that by the rise of UKIP and by the Conservatives' policy. So where do you stand on where the refugees are at the moment? All right, well, slightly different point, but Jill? Yes, um, well, I think, I think it illustrates the problems when you seek to get involved and destabilise regimes without working out what will replace them. And I think this has been the problem throughout our recent foreign policy mm. because it's, it's fine to get on the side of, if you like, the revolutionaries, if you like a particular faction who do seem to be more moderate, could be better news than a despotic government, but once you've actually thrown in the match and, and set, set light to the whole thing, you then have great movements of people. It's not like the days when 
the West could move in on an unstable country and say, OK, we'll take over here. We'll settle in, we'll run it like you know, part of the empire, and we will ensure that democracy uh, takes charge and everybody has, has, you know, it's a free country and we impose our laws and our Western standards and you live under that and everybody settles down and does as they're told. OK, that, that model that went with the empire. But if we now move in and into situations where we really don't know what's going to replace the current regime, unpleasant though that may, regime may be, we end up with, with shifting people across the world, risking their lives uh, to come to Europe in search of shelter. And this is wrong. You know, we, we have to answer for some of this. It right. is, Nikki, because... Well, what's wrong is the fact that you have a Syrian civil war in which 10.5 million people have been displaced from their homes. 4 million people have fled the country. Mm. 250,000 Muslims have been killed. I voted strongly for action in 2013. I'd but, like to know how Caroline voted in stopping I mean, the Syrian asked, war. Imagine, I'd you like to know, about, had we removed Assad, what, what, would, what, would, what would have been the result? Had we removed Assad? I have no brief for him, but had we he removed is, him, he was, who would he have taken charge? His who would have taken charge? dropping barrel bombs on his citizens. Yes, but what was the alternative? I'm sorry, Jill. I cannot believe I'm hearing this. The alternative has led to the situation that we now see where we are facing a clear and present threat in this country and other countries the security services said they have disrupted seven plots in the last year. We've got ten times the number of IS plots around but the world. Nikki, we are I'm past so... saying, should we get involved? We are involved. We have to join with the international coalition to deal with, as I said, this right. murderous death cult. I'm, I'm not clear, Jill, what your um, yes, prescription yes, is, but I'll come to you. I want to hear from some more in the room. You, sir, in the front there. Nobody should be going into military action with a clapping their hands with joy. But in the end, we have to learn something from history. All the despots, dictators this world has created have happened because somebody has let it. Absolutely. And didn't do but, but there are it. different ways of stopping it than military ways. And if the advice we're getting is that the military ways are not actually going to work, then let's do some of the things that Diane was saying. Let's, for example, be encouraging the Abadi government in, in Iraq to be reaching out to the neglected Sunni um, minority where ISIS is recruiting. Let's do exactly that what Diane said. Why are we still holding arms to Saudi Arabia, okay. which are then getting right. used in places like Let Yemen, which is then destabilising that ISIS is going there? Can you pick up, Diane, can you pick up this point? Because um, Hillary Benn yesterday said these people were fascists and the Labour Party has always fought fascism. Was he right to put it like that? No. No, you're not asking <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Whatever you think. <laughs> he was right as far as it goes, but that was 50 years ago. This is the 21st century and we're facing global internet-based jihadism. It's not a simple... You could smash Raqqa to smithereens. You'd kill tens of thousands of people, but that still wouldn't lessen the threats on the streets of Birmingham or Paris or London. Mm -hmm. We are in the 21st century. We need a broad strategy. It is so wrong to encourage people to believe that a short, sharp bout of bombing will deal with the, the problems we face. And let, me, and let me just say this. Let me, let me just strike an uncharacteristically conciliatory note. <clears throat> this is not a left-right issue. Some of the best speeches yes, against absolutely. this bombing in the House yesterday were John Barron, a former army man, uh, Julian Lewis, the chair of the Defence Select Committee, and their point was, and it speaks to people saying we've got to do something, that in military terms, in military terms, what Cameron is suggesting makes no sense. There is no end game, and we could easily get dragged into sending troops no, no, into no, a no, land no, war no, no. in Syria. Right. You, you, madam, you were there, yes, you. Yeah, well, the first thing I'd like to say is I take huge offence to being labelled as a terrorist sympathiser. Yeah. Just because. Yeah. Because I have a different approach to this. I personally believe that we are pursuing a course of action that has no proven track record of long-term success. And I'm looking long-term. You're talking about going in, uh, attacking oil tanks, whatever. I totally agree with you, Diane, that there are other actions that we should be taking. We should be taking a far more divisive hand with Qatar, Kuwait, Turkey, countries that are funneling money to ISIS 
through donorship, through buying oil, through whatever. It's an uncomfortable truth that needs to be faced. Okay. And simply blanket bombing Syria is not going to just solve on that it. Point. Oh, uh, uh, Nikki, do you think... Just for you, the point she raised, do you think the Prime Minister should have apologised for talking about a bunch of terrorist sympathisers going through the lobbies with Jeremy Corbyn? What he made very clear in the debate was that the he never people on either side... He didn't apologise. Why he not? Did, uh, no, you, uh, because... Surely you should say that he, he should apologise. I wasn't at the meeting. I don't know what oh, he said. On. I don't know what the context. Oh, but actually, it wasn't, he said made it come very, on. very clear. Do you do you he's never denied it. Like terrorist sympathiser to no, you. No, but Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell do. No, John McDonnell. Oh, oh, no, 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 Nikki has a point. I don't like being called a terrorist sympathiser. If that was the implication of what David Cameron said, however. Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have been, they've been photographed yep. shaking the hands of Gerry Adams and others Hezbollah, and yeah. making it quite clear that they will support certain what certainly I would you, regard as terrorist Are you factions. saying that no, leader, let, let Diane answer this. Are you saying that the leader of the Labour Party supports terrorism? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is No, are you saying that? I I am sure that he has in the past supported terrorism, no. and I haven't seen him recant. No, but that's what you no. said, and Nikki. The fact that wait, 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 Jeremy, let's just clarify Jeremy this. Jeremy Corbyn has said in June of this year he talked about our friends from Hezbollah. Oh. John McDonnell talked about the bombs and the bullets and the sacrifice made by uh, the IRA. And last week on this programme, Ken Livingstone, the leader of your Defence Review, Diane, talked about people on 7-7 who gave their lives. The bombs. Nikki. What about the people who lost their exactly. lives? Exactly. Nikki. What about people who lost their lives on the and that fight? These are old smears and they They're do not, not smears. They, they are direct quotes. these are old smears and they do not detract from the fact that in my view and the view of millions of british people the house of commons made the wrong decision right, yesterday that is perfectly and this... honorable position to have diane it's a perfectly honorable position to have to have voted against the motion the prime minister made that very very clear but those okay. are two statements uh, and another one that ken livingston made on this program last week and I think what people wanted to hear was the debate on the issues that we had tonight and what we had in the House for ten and a half hours yesterday. So you're saying, you're saying that it's right to call them terrorist sympathisers, but you wouldn't call her a terrorist sympathiser because she opposed I the I have made it very clear that the lady, and her, with her views, and the Prime Minister made it very clear yesterday that members who did not support military action and voted a different way from the government were perfectly honourable in holding okay. that view. The man in the white shirt there, in the middle, you. Uh, I'd like to bring up a point that hasn't been discussed yet. Right. Is that one of the reasons that we have uh, taken this action is because one of our closest allies, France, plead for our support. Yeah. And I was thinking, if this happened in London, and it could have been our friends, our family, would we not expect the same support from France? And how would, and how would you feel if they didn't support us in that Can way. Caroline Lucas? Well, I, I think the point still remains that what you would want is for your friends to do the thing that is going to be most effective. And if by getting involved in military action, we are going to hand a propaganda coup, coup to ISIS, which is going to allow them to recruit yet more people and put more people at risk, then I don't think that's the right thing to do. But there are plenty of things we can be doing. We've been outlining them right now. So my answer to France would be, of course our hearts go out to you. But there were people who were caught up in that Bataclan, uh, you know, chaos, people from the UK who themselves have said they, they don't want this as a response. They want a response that's going to work. Yeah, and the position that we're taking here, Diane and I and, and Jill too, is not that we're not doing this because we're somehow squeamish about it. We're saying it is not going to be effective. Right. The Defence Select Committee is saying that. Okay. You, sir, with the white... Yes, in the yes. second row from the back, yes. Uh, the world's facing possibly the greatest crisis ever, possibly. And what about the United Nations? Are they no longer relevant? Well, what do you think? Well, they're not making any statements. There doesn't yeah, seem to be any movements. I'm sure there are things going on, but there's no lead from the United Nations. And we've got so many different angles from different countries. That's what the United Nations were there for. But they, they, have passed, they, have they passed this resolution to saying fair. all necessary steps should be taken. Well, yes, I, yes but they're not taking much ice. of a lead, are they? I mean, you know, we've just heard that from you. I don't see much, uh, many United Nations leaders talking about it, giving any speeches, letting the public know what's going on. Majid. Yeah, I mean, fair point, there, are, there, are, there need to be more speeches to let the public know what's going on, but they did say, I mean, this is what, actually, I was, it leads on to what I was going to say anyway, that 
I don't think anyone is, 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 who supported the vote yesterday is, is, is saying that this is the solution to the problem. You know, often we set up straw men and then blow them down. No one who supported the yes vote yesterday is suggesting that these strikes are going to rid us of this, this, this thing called ISIS. I think what they're suggesting is that it's adding to the options that we have. And yet still, people on this panel, including myself, and Diane said it earlier, is that we need an overall global strategy to deal with this. But actually, if you look at the allies that we're supporting, the UN has said all means necessary to deal with ISIS. The Iraqi government has requested our support in dealing with ISIS in, in, in airstrikes in Iraq. The, the Kurds have been pro-strikes. The rebels inside Syria who are anti-Assad have been pro-strikes. Even the illegitimate Assad regime has welcomed the UN vote to strike in, in, in Syria. Everyone wants this to happen. No. And if you speak to those on the ground, you say, what effect is it producing? If you speak to the rebels and the Kurds, who every day are fighting ISIS on the ground, they'll tell you what effect it's producing because they've been able to kick out ISIS from Sinjar, from Raqqa, as a result of these airstrikes. It helps them actively on the ground. Right. It doesn't solve the problem, but it tactically helps them. Wait, I, I'm, I'm going to... I want to just come back to, the, to yesterday in the House of Commons. We've had half the programme on this, but we had a lot of questions on this next topic. I'd just like to touch on that. It's a question from Angela Griffin, please. Has Hilary Benn's speech in the House of Commons weakened Jeremy Corbyn's leadership? There was a lot of comment on the way that Hilary Benn got applauded, uh, and you mentioned mm. at the beginning. Has it weakened Jeremy Corbyn's leadership? Let's just deal with this Labour Party issue. Nicky Morgan. <clears throat> Well, I think what it did show was to the Labour Party um, that there was another person who was uh, capable of being a leader. It was the most extraordinary speech. I don't know how it came across to those watching on TV, but I can tell you, standing in the chamber, regardless of your views and which party you're a member of, it was somebody who drive it spine tingling, and it was absolutely right. And the reason the ladies talked about the, the cheering at the end, I think because it was so extraordinary and the debate, the day had been so intense, that was what led, I think, to the applause and the cheers. And I take your point about it was a sombre day and a sombre motion. Uh, look, this is for the Labour Party to, to, to deal with. I saw the look of fear on some of the Labour MPs' lot of faces who were in our lobby last night. Um, they were seriously worried about the consequences. We've heard, obviously, Ken Livingston today talking about deselections. This is a matter for the Labour Party. But all I would just say is that it is important, regardless of uh, what we might think, and I think as a government minister, having a strong opposition is something this country needs. Uh, and, um, and I think that was, Hilary Benn has shown that uh, quite extraordinary qualities in that speech last night. Nice. Mm. <laughs> Diane, Diane Abbott, is, is Jeremy Corbyn's position weaker as a result? You know, let's just say Hilary Benn made a bravura speech. If you half shut your eyes, you could have thought it was Tony Benn speaking. It just so happened he was wrong on the issue, but it was a great speech. Um, as for him having great qualities, fortunately, in the Labour Party, we have many people with great qualities. The truth about Jeremy Corbyn is he's faced a cacophony of sneering from the London elite ever since he became leader. I don't agree with Jeremy Corbyn on everything. I've known him a long time. It's long been my view that Jeremy should invest in a decent suit, for instance. But, no <laughs> but you know, nonetheless, he's a very genuine person with very genuine beliefs. He's different from the regular run of politicians. He's not a 40-year-old guy who went to Oxford and wears smart suits. He believes what he believes. He has the biggest mandate of any Labour leader ever. So is he acting like a strong leader? Well, you see, this idea of what constitutes a strong leader, Jill, what, what I'm saying to you is this. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is this, that what Jeremy was saying about the airstrikes is supported by the overwhelming majority of Labour members, <laughs> the majority of Labour MPs. I believe in less than 12 months the public will come round because I think these, these airstrikes are very ill-fated and Jeremy will surprise all of you despite the sneering. He stands for certain values which the British people value. This Tory party is going to hit very rocky waters. Don't. We've defeated them on tax credits. We've de defeated them on police cuts. We've taken oh. the right position <laughs> on their airstrikes. And I believe that Jeremy Corbyn can lead the Labour Party to victory. Right. Can, I, can I put to you something you said just three or four days ago? Uh, a party of government 
has to have a position on a matter of peace and war. The problem about a free vote for Labour is it hands victory to Cameron. Is that what happened? And should he have stuck with a whipped vote and telling Labour, if you go against the vote, you're out of the shadow cabinet? You know, it's no secret. My view is we should have whipped the vote. The Tories whipped their vote. If they hadn't whipped their vote, there'd be many more people voting okay. against. But is that you know, right? No. How do you know? How do you know? Because... That's uh, why you have a whip. No, because, yeah, because... I mean, if you had voted against... <laughs> if, you had, if you had voted against, you would have lost your job. Anybody who voted against would lose but, their job, a hundred or so people. Yeah, because I don't think there were people... At the end of the day, there was a small minority in the, in the party, my party, who clearly didn't want to support the government last night, but I can tell you can the absolutely I... overwhelming mood on our benches was one of supporting the Prime Minister. Yeah, quite right. right. But you did have a whip vote. We did have a whip vote, and yeah. I, yeah, but yeah. I don't think... I think the results yes. from the, my party would have been the same you, that I think, just, on, just on my whip vote, just this, it, it, I made no secret I wanted a whip vote because I felt it would have enabled us to run the government closer. But, you know, Jeremy is really concerned to bring people together. Yeah, but he he's bringing, bringing, no, 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 just bringing let together... Let me finish, let me finish. She hasn't he, started. He, Exactly. Jill, I mean, not you, not you, Jill. I, 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 I'm trying to ask you a question. Yeah, what's the question? Why, OK, you think he should, he should have yeah. told his shadow cabinet to get in line or get out. No! Don't you? No! I mean, I'm... don't you think it was ridiculous no. that a man of conviction, no. which is what everybody tells us Jeremy Corbyn is, a man of conviction could not tell his party to fall in line behind him and those who wouldn't should leave the shadow cabinet. Collective responsibility. He could have, doing Diane, he could have replaced Hillary Benn with you because he'd have had someone to sum up at the end oh. of the debate who agreed with him. Hillary Benn and he would have been able smart. to show can that I he... Can that I, he I, believed I, 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 right. different kind of politics. What? Go on. I, I know it sounds radical. A different kind of politics. Yeah, a shock horror. Not but but you know what? Promised. Yes, and I think if, if we gave him a bit of a chance, he might just be able to deliver it as well. I think what he's talking about what I think was a mistake, what I think was a mistake, because actually I think that on issues of going to war, it is appropriate to have a free vote. You know, they had a free vote about fox hunting, for goodness sake. I think we should be having a free vote when it comes to something as serious as that, because MPs have to examine their conscience, but they also have to examine the evidence. And what happened during the Iraq war is that MPs, in a sense, could kind of outsource their brains to the whips, not look at the evidence, and then therefore go along with their whips and take us into the catastrophe that was the Iraq war. Right, so I think for matters of, of, of war, there should not be a whipped vote, but I think what Jeremy should have done is to have positioned that right from the start as something that he said as a position of strength. I will do politics differently. We will have a free vote on this. Instead right. of which, it looked as if it was a sign of weakness because he was forced into doing it. Uh, you said that. What do you think? Yeah, just come back to the original question. Yes. Did it weaken um, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership? I think it did, um, because listening to that speech, the way that he articulated his point, Hillary Benn, the way he articulated his point so clearly and so succinctly actually changed my opinion on it. So yeah. I do think he has weakened Hillary, um, nope. Jeremy Corbyn's mm. leadership. Now you changed your mind listening to, the, listening uh, to Hillary it, Benn? It's an impossible choice, but after listening to the speech, the way that he was so balanced in articulating his point, it did... Swim my decision, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, and you, sir, in blue there. And then I'll come to you at the back. Yes. I think being a leader, you have to show a position of strength. And in answer to her question, uh, I think, yes, it has weakened his position. And uh, I was one of the people that applauded that speech of Hillary Benn yesterday. He really stood out amongst that, uh, that party. OK, and so, uh, Angela Griffin, what do you think? You asked the question. I think Conservative now have found a, a good opposition. In Hillary Benn? In Hillary Benn. Yes. You think you'll become leader of the party then? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, think, I would say, yes. I, I cometh the hour, cometh the man. And I think that yeah. this particular speech, or woman, but we're talking about Hillary yeah. Benn, so I think this particular, there are plenty of women on this panel. Um, I think right. this particular speech was, uh, yes, the one time I won't find myself complaining being a minority, actually. Um, <laughs> this, this, this particular speech was, I think, fantastic. I would salute Hillary Benn, I would salute Tom Watson, I would salute Stella Creasy and all those 66 Labour MPs who went with their conscience mm -hmm. and, and voted because they thought that this was above party politics. And I find that when we look at the issue and the questions of leadership, I don't want to blame uh, Corbyn. I don't want to make it all about Corbyn because actually I think unfairly sometimes he does get an unfair deal. But actually I, I'm more, more concerned about the mood. And what I mean by the mood is that if last week on this programme, as you mentioned, Nikki, we can have your shadow defence, Ken Livingstone, uh, suggest that those who murdered people uh, gave their lives in protest. I mean, murder can never be a form of protest. Okay. But when he phrased it in that way, um, and look, you know, I've been through all the grievances he spoke about. I've been, I've witnessed torture in jail. I've been in prison, detained without charge. I've had my DNA taken. Uh, but I'm not killing people. 
right? So whatever we want, however we explain those grievances, they make people angry, we cannot justify terrorism. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because that same Ken Livingstone then goes on. So one, he's making excuses for terrorists. He wants to talk to terrorists and he wants to say we can understand them. And yet he's not willing to understand the motives of those 66 MPs of his own party that basically voted for intervention in Syria, but he's basically suggesting they should be deselected. On the one hand, we're sympathising with terrorists. We can't even sympathise with our own members of parliament because of the way they vote. It's just that mood that I find... Incomprehensible. And I'm not making it about Jeremy Corbyn. You've got to admit, Diane, that, that what Ken Livingstone said last week with his remarks yesterday, you cannot justify that. Don't defend him, please. Whatever you do right now, <laughs> what you can say, do not defend Ken's remarks. Ken, Ken doesn't need me to defend him. Just on yeah. Caroline and whipping, I would just say very gently, Caroline can afford to take her position on whipping, because there's only one person in her party. <laughs> she is both the party leader, the whip, and the backbencher. Um, on I, the I don't think that's... On I the think still have a substantive view on yeah, it, course, and I think it's a very yeah, relevant view course. to say that people should be looking at their consciences and the evidence, not simply going through, like, right. lots of fodder, course, yeah. mindlessly, actually, which is what has got us into so many problems Caroline, in the past. Caroline, in 28 years, I've never been described as lobby fodder. So but we'll just this thing about the death of the Labour Party and the collapse of Corbyn's leadership. You know, yesterday I had lunch with a group of MPs I have lunch with every Wednesday. Half of them voted very seriously against the action. Half of them voted for the action. Actually, as Labour MPs, we have more to unite us than divide us. Basically, protecting our constituents from this Tory government. And, you know, all of this sneering at Jeremy and his leadership. Hillary made a brilliant speech in the moment. But I'm telling this audience that Jeremy Corbyn will be proved right about the Syria airstrike. The trouble is that... Right. <laughs> OK, let, let's, 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 ab uh, let's ab abandon Mr Corbyn for a moment <laughs> and get the man at the very back there, you and... Yeah, hi, uh, yeah. hi Diane. I speak as a member of the Labour Party. Uh, I actually thought that uh, Hillary's performance yesterday just showed how poor a leader Jeremy Corbyn was. I mean, his performance yesterday was very, very bad. Uh, I personally think that, uh, that there's a civil war going on within the Labour Party at the moment and I think that the actions of uh, Jeremy have not actually helped things. He's been very div divisive, he's appointed very controversial people, and he's gone behind the back of his shadow cabinet and his MPs. And I personally think that we are talking about bombing a while ago in Syria. The Labour Party is bombing in the polls. I think what Jeremy should do is do the honourable thing, put his party before his ambitions, and resign as leader of the Labour Party. OK. And, and you here? One point, and then we'll go on to a, another subject. I'd probably okay. say that, obviously, what Hillary said last night was uh, quite astounding, and the Commons will obviously remember it, but how could you... Jeremy's got the biggest ever mandate of his party, and that's something that everybody across the whole political spectrum has got to respect and take into account. And if they don't, that is unfair politics right there for you. OK. Right. We've only, got, we've only got ten minutes left, and I think we'll go on to a, a, another, another topic. Uh, just to say, uh, next week, Bath, the week after that, Slough, and the details are on the screen. We'll give them again at the end. Let's have this question from Dylan Gibbons, please. Dylan Gibbons. Why did the government appear to be so aggressive and ill-informed in its negotiations with junior doctors? The junior doctors strike, which was called off, remember, 98% of doctors, 37,000 of them, voted for a strike. Why was uh, Jeremy Hunt so aggressive and ill-informed and the government so aggressive and ill-informed? Uh, Jill Kirby, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's a bit of a mess. I think uh, we have to be relieved for now that the junior doctors aren't striking and hope this gets sorted out. I think that some of the difficulty is that the government has not really been very clear about what the objective is here. Um, we're told it's about seven-day working. Um, now, seven-day working in the NHS and a seven-day service uh, means different things to different people. I think we need to be confident that we can all see a GP when we desperately need to at a weekend, and we can be looked after in hospital at weekends. But hospital doctors are already working weekends. GPs aren't. Do we really want our GPs to be on duty in the surgery for routine appointments for seven days a week? It's quite confusing, as to, uh, I'm confused at least, as to what the government really seeks to get out of this. I don't think most people do expect seven days, every part of the NHS to be seven day working, but what they do expect is that in hospital they will be properly cared for throughout the weekends. Now entangled with this is the question of whether the junior doctors are being paid enough already or not enough 
whether the restrictions on their working hours have led to them losing out in terms of their pay, their overtime and so on. It's What's your interpretation entangled. of it? Um, I think that... The I mean, their position is perfectly I, clear. They I, say it's phony that they're getting 11% pay increase. They're actually going to lose 30% of their salaries, according yeah. to their union. Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't know what the truth of that is. I think they're pretty... They're, a lot of them are pretty fed up, but also there are an awful lot of junior doctors who did not get involved in this action at all. What worries me more, really, in the long term is, is whether we're going to be able to afford to pay our doctors enough to keep them in this country working in the NHS and where the NHS model is totally bust anyway. OK, you, sir, over there. You, doctor? Uh, I've worked in the health uh, yeah. service for a long time and I think one of the biggest problems is this misconception that there's still some fat and wastage in the NHS. There absolutely isn't. Apart from the Greek model of economics which pervades through the, um, the accounting process of the way the NHS is run, on the shop floor, there is little but the smell left on the bone as far as, as, far as the sort of slack in the system is concerned. There is not any more cutting that could possibly be done. Um, you know, I've worked with doctors, midwives, nurses of all different uh, professions, and the professions are absolutely on their knees as far as keeping the health service going right. is concerned. And Dylan Gibbons. <laughs> You ask question. You also work in the NHS. I do, yes. As what? I'm uh, an NHS manager. One of those. I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> now, so that was tease. What's yeah. your what's what's your view of of the way the whole thing has been handled? Well, I think it was it was it's just been very surprising. I think, as Jill said, it seems to be uh, quite confusing. Um, I think I think they seem to be ill-advised to imply that the um, lack of junior doctors the weekend was causing. A, a, a very large increase in the number of deaths. I don't think that is as clear-cut as, as it's laid out, although there are some issues that need to be addressed for the weekend. What do you think of the handling of it? I mean, you th say it's aggressive and ill-informed? That's right, yes. It was, it was, um, it was surprising. Um, I did speak to a national clinical leader, and she said that the advisers of the Department of Health were maybe not giving very good advice to the Secretary of State. OK, Nicky Morgan? Well, I don't recognise the characterisation as, as, as aggressive and, and ill-advised, but I think uh, what I, where I do agree with you is the fact that there are reforms that still need to be made, and this is a contract which the BMA have been calling to be modernised since 2008. Uh, and there is a need for, uh, I take Jill's point about different parts of the NHS, um, but I think there is evidence that shows if you are admitted and uh, need uh, something uh, seriously done operational at the weekend, then your chances of survival uh, can be less. And we also know there's, there's just huge pressure on the NHS. I represent a constituency in Leicestershire that has, I think, the busiest accident emergency in the country. Uh, and clearly, that whole hospital needs to be working uh, effectively seven days a week to cope uh, with the, uh, the demand from uh, patients on it. Uh, but the important point is that uh, the, the parties are now uh, talking, and this is also about having a, a safer NHS in terms of working hours for the junior doctors. And so under the change of the contract, their the working hours maximum goes down from, I think, just 90, over just over 90, 91, down to, to 72 in a, in a uh, seven-day period. So it, it is important that that contract is modernised, both parties are now talking, and uh, you know that's what we will get there, uh, and then we can all go forward uh, to the NHS that we that we want. Uh, well, if it works out, but do you believe their claim that they were going to lose 30% of their salary as a result of these measures? Uh, I don't. I mean, I think the the contract, the, the, the changes that showed the, the department, uh, what Jeremy was saying is that uh, actually there will be no one losing out, and in fact, actually, there were 75% of people mm -hmm. who would who would get more uh, when working at the legal hours. Caroline Lucas. Well, I, I can just hear junior doctors all around the country at this point probably throwing things at the television and screaming because the kind of <coughs> description that you're hearing from Nicky Morgan does not actually match up to what I've been hearing from junior doctors in my constituency and beyond. They are speechless really about the contempt with which they have been treated by this government. Not just them but we've also seen now as well the nurses whose bursaries are going to be cancelled and they're going to have to pay for their training too. So this is a government that doesn't care very much about the NHS. It is also a government that doesn't mind about launching a campaign of misinformation about what junior doctors do. They already work at weekend. <laughs> they are taking the action, or were willing to take the action, being forced to take the action that they were, because they care about their patients and they want their patients to be 
safe. And that's why they were focusing on this contract that, let's not forget, was being imposed upon them till the very last minute, at the very last minute. Thank goodness Jeremy Hunt blinked. But up until that point, he was trying to say that if you don't agree with me, I'm just going to impose this contract on you anyway. What kind of way is that to treat professionals who do not go into the NHS to make huge amounts of money? They go into it because they absolutely care about it. All right. We have to speed up a bit because we're coming towards the end. Yes. Who works in the NHS, and she said that she couldn't believe the fact that these doctors were wandering out in their scrubbers over the infection lines, going out, speaking to patients. And she said the biggest reason that they spend so much money is because they get infections. And yet, that's another way that if they didn't wander over in their scrubs, that would be a way that would take off a load off the junior doctors. But we don't talk about the waste in the NHS ever. Okay, and the man behind you in the blue shirt. Um, thank you. Uh, Caroline, you just talked about the government don't care about the NHS, but may I take you back to May? when the Conservatives proposed £10 billion mm. to put into the NHS, far more than any other party... If you party. look at how that Hold compares... On, let, let, let him finish. Okay, sorry. Far more than any other party. So how can you say that this government doesn't care about the NHS because when it's it investing more than let ever me, before? All right, I'll redirect it to Diane Abbott, if I may, because of the time. <laughs> Inflation and population, I would simply D say. Diane Abbott. <laughs> My mum was a nurse, so full disclosure, I know how hard and committed NHS workers are. I could not believe Jeremy Hunt again and again going into the media and saying, in effect, people were dying at weekends because junior doctors didn't work weekends. You know, Andrew Lansley was their first health secretary. He fell out with everybody. Uh, d d d d d d Jeremy Hunt was brought in to be Mr Nice Guy. He's now falling out with everybody. There's a systemic problem between Tory oh, health rubbish. ministers and the oh, NHS. Because if you work in the NHS, oh, you know they do not mean the NHS any good. It's systemic. Hold on, hold on, hold on <laughs> a second. All right, go on, since yeah. you're halfway so, through. So Patricia Hewitt ruined life for junior doctors. Mr. Hunt, unfortunately... Under Labour, this is. Yes, under Labour. Mr. Hunt is doing the same thing. Now, Mr. Hunt has lied about weekend mortality. There is no yeah. increased yeah. death at weekends. Not and to the point, I, 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 I work in liver transplant. My patients do not want to come in on weekends for an emergency transplant because they believe... Uh, uh, Jeremy... I'm not going to pronounce his surname because I might mispronounce it deliberately. <laughs> a life-saving transplant operation, they will die. And that liver goes to someone else. Now, given his profound incompetence at this junior doctor's contract issue, as well as previous health secretaries, is it not time for a cross-party healthcare commission to save our NHS? All right. And now, you. Very good. Yeah. You, sir. You stole the words from my mouth. I was about to say, you sound like a doctor. I know my family's full of them, and you sound exactly... You stole the words from my mouth. I think the only solution to this, as is done with MP salaries, by the way, is an independent commission that looks at the future of the NHS, and it's currently, as it stands, unsustainable. How I know that... I don't know how much time I have, but I you want to... It's, OK, so <laughs> all, I, all I'm going to say is that if my father, who goes in for surgery, is in the operating theatre, is in the robes, is anaesthetised, and then they say, sorry, we've got no beds, we have to take you back again... I mean, this is a terrible situation. It's unsustainable. We need an independent inquiry. Well, into can I just... We have the no, our, our, our time's independence. up. Sorry to can all of you. Can we talk about climate change no, next week, David? We'll I can't about... believe we've got the UN climate talks happening now and we haven't talked about it one second. We'll talk about security. <laughs> climate is the biggest sector of security. All right. All right. Well, you might have expected it and we might have got to it if we hadn't spent so much time talking about uh, Iraq and Syria.